This is what I'm going to be talking about, a bit about the economy, um, some, some numbers and some views on current market activity and prospective market activity in the industrial logistics market, um, overview of our current forecasts, and um, some issues then that Richard can then interrogate the panel about, very learned and experienced panel, and hopefully which will provide some stimulus for you to ask questions of your own. Um, starting with the economy, I tend to think, you know, when, when, when embarking on a journey, it makes sense to, to start to think about where you're, where you're beginning from. Um, so, it's, you know, it might be worth a second on what 2014 contained. There were some alarms. Um, it was a period of gradual and uneven recovery in the European economy, some, some unusual, sometimes contradictory data, um, continuing very low interest rates uh, throughout the European markets and some, some sort of left field issues, certainly some geopolitical concerns that were uppermost in, in the minds of, of certain players in the market, and the start of um, you know, a pretty steep uh, fall in oil prices towards the end of the year. Is that levelling out now? So there were some quite unusual factors to, to, to wrestle with. Um, equally, there were some, some familiar ones, um, things that we've seen before, and no doubt we'll see again. Um, uh, the net upshot of that, actually, was... was reasonably positive for European economies. The European economy did grow last year um, by just under 1%, which is not particularly remarkable for this stage in the cycle, but it is growth. But it was very uneven. If we look at um, economic sentiment indicators for different bits of Europe, what we've shown here is the, the most recent position uh, in light green and the position a year ago in, in dark green. You can see it's a very, very variegated, very diverse picture. We've seen some, some quite large improvements in certain parts of CEE, in certain of the what we might call the, the recovery markets, particularly Ireland, but also Spain, where sentiment has improved quite markedly over, over the past year. The, perhaps more, the, the softer, perhaps weaker spots include Italy and France, um, where overall sentiment uh, among corporates is, is still in, in, in somewhat negative territory. Um, and, and, and Germany as well, you know, in, in improving uh, relative to, to, to where it was. So a pretty mixed picture. And if we put that in, in a longer term context and, and group those markets, it's quite noticeable what happened certainly in the, in the second half of the year in particular. The Eurozone core, um, Italy, France, Germany, Benelux, actually, you know, towards the end of the, the, the year, seemed to be flattening off, sentiment not rebounding uh, as strongly as, as elsewhere. Uh, the northern markets, which is effectively the UK and, and Scandinavia, had for a while been seeing stronger sentiment readings uh, and still are, as you can see from that, although the most recent numbers are not indicative of, a, uh, of a, an acceleration in particular. But the big story really was the, the, the periphery, Spain, Ireland, Portugal, even Greece, dare I say, um, seeing slightly stronger numbers. Um, Unit labour costs uh, uh, have come down, competitiveness or degree of competitiveness has, has been restored, uh, and deleveraging has had some beneficial impact on, on those markets. So there is, uh, you know, a changing in, in the order, if you like, and it's really the, the core Eurozone markets that are perhaps still a little bit troubling in that context. But on a longer term view, this is what we're expecting to happen over the, the, the next five years or so, in terms of annual average GDP growth, CEE principally Poland, but also other CE markets seeing growth of above, GDP growth above 3%. UK, they're at 2.5%. Uh, uh, the Nordics, and, and Russia obviously has been, uh, has been marked down quite severely in the last few months for fairly obvious reasons. Um, picking out certain markets within, within the Eurozone, as I said a minute ago, it's really the recovery markets, Ireland and Spain doing relatively strongly there. Um, <coughs> Germany, Netherlands, France, and particularly Italy, Perhaps, you know, a slower growth trajectory, growth of perhaps 1.5% uh, per annum over that period, which will be perhaps something of a limiting factor in terms of demand growth. The, the slight spanner in the works here is, is, is government bond yields. Now, we know for some interest rates have been low generally for some time. We've seen the introduction of QE recently uh, across Europe by the ECB. Um, there is very little general price pressure in the European economies, and bond yields generally, um, you know, even safe haven economies like Germany, the UK, even Italy, have been trending downwards very, very steeply. Um, uh, and there is little uh, in the short term, in fact, there's nothing in the short term, I don't think, to expect that that's going to uh, rebound. The expectation is that interest rates, both short term and long term, will remain lower uh, for longer. Now, you would expect that that would have a beneficial impact on economies generally. Um, and we think it will. Um, there is an argument, and it may be something the panel want to comment on, what happens and how soon does that rebound? 
It clearly has a, an impact on real estate pricing as well as it does on economic fundamentals um, in that it keeps the risk-free rate lower for longer and that ought to have a bearing on the pricing of other assets including real estate and including logistics which is something that I'll come back to later on. Just a few numbers on, on market activity, starting with, with, with leasing activity. We actually saw uh, a pretty strong rebound in leasing activity last year, arguably a, a disproportionate rebound, given that progress on the economic front was, was slow in certain places. So big pickup. You'll see that follows two years of, of, of decline. It will be only a marginal decline in 2013. But it's happening in quite a number of places. France, we saw it, Netherlands, um, most parts of the CE, and also Italy. In some cases, this is um, upgrading. This is a, a preference towards better quality prime space. So that doesn't necessarily create positive net absorption in the market. But equally, in a lot of cases, it isn't. It's genuine expansion. And it's, it's, it's the retail sector, principally, that lies behind that, um, both food and, and non-food, but also certain swathes of manufacturing, including food manufacturing, pharma, uh, automobile components, and so on. And 3PLs in many cases fronting that, but those sectors lying behind that um, have all contributed to that pickup. Generally, and this is a, a sort of structural point rather than a comment on last year, we are seeing a, a polarisation in demand whereby it's most uh, marked either for very large strategic um, XXL warehouses in highly accessible um, strategic European locations, and at the other end of the spectrum, smaller urban logistics parcel delivery centres. I think that's still a characteristic of, of, of demand as we go forward. It perhaps raises the question as to what happens to stock that doesn't fulfill, existing stock that doesn't fulfill either of those characteristics. Is there a, a squeezed middle, if you like? Um, but certainly it's indicative of stronger demand at either end of that spectrum. That hasn't as yet, um, at least in general terms, it hasn't been uh, sufficient to, to push rents up very much. This is. Uh, these are indices of year-on-year -year growth in um, prime rents uh, for the different sectors around Europe. And you can, I hope, see from that um, the, industrial the industrial line or industrial logistics line is, is above zero in year-on-year -year terms, but it's only about 1.5%. But it's within the, the, the range of, of other sectors. Um, retail a little bit stronger, but generally um, rental growth you know, above zero, but probably negative still in, in real terms. I think it's important also to recognise that certainly for the industrial and logistics sector, that's the product of, of, of growth in a fairly small number of locations so far, including the UK uh, and parts of Germany uh, and some parts of the Nordics. But generally, um, prime rents have been stable and, and no more than that so far. Turning to the in investment market, we see a much, much stronger picture, both generally and with respect to, to industrial and logistics. This is overall commercial property investment, all sectors across Europe. Um, last year's total was, um, which is the line on here rather than the, rather than the bars, um, was about 220 billion euro, mm -hmm. which is 30% up on the previous year. So a big expansion in investment turnover um, in, in commercial property last year. <laughs> And an even bigger one with respect to industrial logistics. This number was up to over 23 billion. It was up 45% or thereabouts on, on 2013. And you can see from that 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 eclipses even the, the sorts of turnover levels that we were seeing uh, in 2007. In terms of the composition of that, big increase in the UK, big increase in the Nordics, which certainly seems to, to, to be receiving pretty strong capital appetite at the moment. Um, an increase in, in Germany, albeit not quite as marked as those other two, uh, less of an increase in France and, and the CEE. But generally, very, very large expansion in appetite for, uh, for the sector, as evidenced by those numbers. What that's done is that's pushed the, the industrial market's share of, of commercial property investment up to about 11% last year. <coughs> um, it's notable also that if you kind of mentally tot up those percentages of the three, com three main commercial sectors, it comes to about 75-78%. Uh, so there is a significant and, and growing contribution from other sectors, student housing, hotels, leisure and so forth. Whether that gets kind of mirrored in microcosm within the industrial and logistics space and there, there is a growth in appetite for, for niche markets, multi-lets and so forth, I think is an interesting point to pick up, not least because you know, even in the context of the growth that we saw in overall and absolute turnover, 
it's still 11% of the market. And there's clearly a scale issue here, given that lot sizes are generally smaller in terms of how far that, that percentage might move. So um, some forecasts. I think, um, again, I, you know, I'm a, I'm a pseudo economist, so I always caveat these sorts of things. Um, uh, and <laughs> as you'll be aware from even a casual reading of the papers at the moment, there is a bit of a Greco-German standoff going on, which might, and I say might, alter the, the architecture of, of European economics and politics. <laughs> quite how that plays out is, is quite difficult to determine, but if you think back to the, to, 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 to the bond yields graph earlier, um, that clearly has a, has, has a potential impact in terms of um, the level and relativity of bond yields going forward. But in general, at the moment, our expectation is, is lower for longer. Um, <coughs> what we've seen in terms of pricing in, in the industrial logistics sector over the long term, as I'm sure you'll be aware, there's been a, a contraction in the typical spread between uh, industrial logistics yields and um, other sectors. I've plotted it relative to offices here. It was 350 basis points um, in the early 90s. It's now nearer 200. The sectors become more institutionally acceptable. Covenant strength has improved. Quality of stocks improved. A whole range of factors have contributed to that. Broadly speaking, going forward, we expect that to, to persist. Um, it is conceivable that um, and I think this is quite an interesting topic for discussion, it's conceivable that yields may move even lower than shown there in the short term, given what we are seeing in terms of the risk-free rate uh, and the level of bond yields at the moment. But we expect, a, a general at the moment, a, a bit more um, contraction in prime yields in the short term um, and, and you know, a levelling out. And in some markets, a bit of a pick-up towards the end of that period as interest rates normalise. But how does that play out in, in, in specific markets? What we've plotted here is the, the current prime yield, or the, the, the end of last year prime yield for individual markets, um, the low point that yields reached generally around 2007, and the high point that they reached generally around 2009. Now you'll see that the ones that I've demarcated in the, the yellow box there, um, yields generally in the, the six to six and a half percent range, but in many cases quite close to or even at the same level as they were uh, at their cyclical low. The further right you go out there, you might argue there is more scope or headroom for, for yields to contract further, given that um, they are still some way off um, uh, their previous cyclical low, or in a few cases haven't moved much lower in the recent improvement at all. So there is a, a, a broad spectrum here. <clears throat> that does inform our, our outlook for yields. There are a number of markets you can see there. Um, principally those to the right of the previous graph, where there, we think there is still scope for, for yields to come in further. There are a few which have um, repriced fairly aggressively already, principally London, where over the, the, and bear in mind this refers to a five year forecast period, we expect yields at the end of that period to be marginally higher than they are now, but may well have moved lower in the meantime. And this is largely predicated on um, where they are relative to previous cyclical highs and lows, rather than relative to their their rental growth outlook. I'd probably accept Paris and Brussels from that, where perhaps more muted rental growth also contributes to that. And in terms of rental growth, we are still expecting um, pretty strong growth in uh, Nordics, parts of CEE, um, and the UK. Um, lower in perhaps fringe parts of CEE, um, some parts of Germany, and, and, and other core bits of the Eurozone. But generally speaking here, I mean, this is, if you look at the numbers along the bottom, we're talking about growth of somewhere between 1% and 2% nominal per annum over that forecast period, other than in markets that are either very con supply constrained, such as uh, London and the South East, or uh, which are expected to see a very strong <coughs> recovery trajectory, such as Dublin. Richard, headline or net effects? Headline. But good question. If we juxtapose some, some yield information alongside that, that rental growth profile, this is what it looks like. So what we've plotted here for each of these markets is, is the current um, industrial logistics yield against the bond yield in each market. Um, the red line is the spread between the two. And as you can see from that, the, the, the spread on the face of it looks fairly attractive and fairly generous. I mean, we're, we're talking about headline spreads here of somewhere between 400 and 600 basis points, um, which in normal conditions would be unusual. Um, <clears throat> the rental growth is, is plotted on the right-hand axis here. So on the face of it, you might be attracted to markets that have got relatively high spreads and relatively strong rental growth. So Prague, Dublin, Oslo, perhaps Madrid, 
um, are, uh, are among those markets. And that does come through in the, the profile of, of overall returns. And bear in mind, these are just absolute return numbers. There's no risk adjustment of any description here. Um, but there are places, recovery markets, Dublin, Barcelona, uh, Madrid, parts of the CEE, uh, Budapest, Prague, where uh, returns of 10% of, of per annum or more are, look achievable. Um, towards the, the bottom of, of this uh, graph, markets that are um, perhaps priced a little bit more, more keenly, and even though some of them are expected to see strong rental growth, returns of 6-7% of, of in prospect. So in general, we think you know, this is a pretty favorable point in the market. There are some who would say it's almost too good to be true. Um, <clears throat> are there differences from 2007 to, to speak to that constituency? We've said prime yields, and particularly prime industrial logistics yields, are comfortably above uh, long-term interest rates. Um, investment is primarily being financed by equity, although that's changing a little bit. And as I said, economies and leasing markets are mostly improving. So that's quite a positive combination of, of circumstances. That doesn't mean there aren't, there aren't risks. We saw, we saw in the credit crunch that events which have their origin in financial or political spheres do sometimes have a tendency to, to ripple out into occupier markets as well. Um, and clearly the discussions going on at the moment um, around Greece, but not only around Greece, which is the important point, um, are, are, are an issue here. I think I would argue that there is some protection for, inbuilt protection for the sector here. It's not generally bought as a growth play because there is strong prospective rental growth um, likely. It, it, you know, it's quite often bought for, for income. So there is, a, there is an inbuilt protection. I think perhaps the focus ought to be on, on exchange rates. Generally, the low level of the euro in the short term we, we would regard as a positive for the sector because it's favourable for, for exports. If, however, exchange rates moved or were anticipated to move into uncomfortable territory, there may be a market reaction to that. And I think for uh, investors in the sector whose liabilities are denominated in some other currency, you could argue there is more of an exchange rate issue evolving there as well. Something to discuss. Is it cheap or expensive? I'm going to leave that question for other people to, to debate, but I think if you, if you chose to come at this question from the perspective of um, uh, the relationship between current pricing and long-term norms, you might argue that it's expensive. If you came at it from the perspective of current pricing against pricing of other assets, debt margins, risk-free rates, you might legitimately argue that it's cheap. I'll leave it there. And where next for capital? We know that there is... We've already seen very significant capital focused on the sector. We know there is, there is more focused on the sector. Um, if you took the view that core assets were tending towards expensive in some markets, that creates the discussion, well, where else does the capital go? What's the appetite for, for secondary assets in, in better markets? And does capital appetite within the sector spill out into perhaps less favored bits of, 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 of the sector, or parts that have been less favored so far?